In September, my dad and I were taking hunting classes together. These classes taught us about different parts of a gun and how to use them safely. Since we were learning face to face, our teachers shared many stories with us. Most of these stories were about accidents that happened because people were careless or drunk while shooting. Many of them had sad endings. During those two weeks, we practiced shooting a lot to get ready for our final test. One day we decided to go to a deserted village where many people went to practice shooting. This village was abandoned because the lead pollution was too high. I felt nervous during our drive there, but I tried to ignore it. That was my first mistake. That evening, we were the only people there. We thought it would be great because we could choose the best spot for ourselves. How wrong we were. We picked a spot behind a small hill, aiming at another hill close by. My dad was adjusting the sights on the .22 rifle we had brought, and I was sitting behind him. I had my earplugs in, so it was difficult to hear anything, especially from far away. Suddenly there was a very loud bang. It must have been my dad, I thought, because the noise was so close and loud. I was really scared. We had heard stories about accidental shots, and they often ended badly. I asked my dad in a worried voice if it was him who fired. When he said no, I became even more scared. Then another shot rang out, and we knew we had to make ourselves seen. We quickly made the gun safe by unloading it, and then we ran up the hill. That was our second mistake. My mom was wearing a bright yellow jacket, and we were all jumping and waving our arms. It seemed impossible that we wouldn't be seen. After a few more shots, we ran to the edge of the area. It looked like a valley or a dry lake with high edges. We were at the bottom, and the shooter was at the top. What happened next made us sure that the shooter had seen us but kept firing anyway. My dad decided to call the police. He moved to a spot where he could see more details, like the color of the truck and how many people were there. Now, he was completely exposed to the shooter. Shortly after my dad called, the shooter drove away, probably thinking the police were on their way. We believed he was shooting at us. We waited a long time for the police. Then, a group of about four teenagers arrived. My dad warned them about what had happened. After waiting 15 minutes without any police showing up, we decided to leave quickly. We collected our things and checked where the shots had landed. The shots had come within 25 meters of us. As we were leaving, the police finally arrived. They asked us some questions, and we were eager to leave that place. The shooter was never caught, and we never returned there. We still don't know if he was trying to scare us, actually shoot us, or was just drunk. Whatever his intention, we were terrified. I hope we never meet that shooter again, whether he was drunk or just aiming from a distance. Only my family and I hope to never cross paths with you again. It must have been my dad, I thought, because the noise was so close and loud. I was really scared. We had heard stories about accidental shots, and they often ended badly. I asked my dad in a worried voice if it was him who fired. When he said no, I became even more scared. Then another shot rang out, and we knew we had to make ourselves seen. We quickly made the gun safe by unloading it, and then we ran up the hill. That was our second mistake. My mom was wearing a bright yellow jacket, and we were all jumping and waving our arms. It seemed impossible that we wouldn't be seen. After a few more shots, we ran to the edge of the area. It looked like a valley, or a dry lake with high edges. We were at the bottom, and the shooter was at the top. What happened next made us sure that the shooter had seen us but kept firing anyway. My dad decided to call the police. He moved to a spot where he could see more details, like the color of the truck and how many people were there. Now he was completely exposed to the shooter. Shortly after my dad called, the shooter drove away, probably thinking the police were on their way. We believed he was shooting at us. We waited a long time for the police. Then a group of about four teenagers arrived. My dad warned them about what had happened. After waiting 15 minutes without any police showing up, we decided to leave quickly. We collected our things and checked where the shots had landed. The shots had come within 25 meters of us. As we were leaving, the police finally arrived. They asked us some questions, and we were eager to leave that place. The shooter was never caught, and we never returned there. We still don't know if he was trying to scare us, actually shoot us, or was just drunk. Whatever his intention, we were terrified. I hope we never meet that shooter again, whether he was drunk or just aiming from a distance. 
Only my family and I hope to never cross paths with you again. Ten years back when I was 23, I lived in a quiet place far from the city in New York State with my ex-boyfriend and his family. We often found ourselves in disagreements. One day, early in the morning before he left for work, we had a really big fight. He was much older than me, but that day, he acted very childish. He got up, showed me an angry gesture, and shouted, If you don't like it here, then go back to the Bronx. That was enough for me. I quickly put on my boots and my winter coat, grabbed my cigarettes, and left the house in a hurry. I often act without thinking, and this time I forgot my phone at home. I couldn't drive, so walking was my only choice. I didn't really plan to walk all the way back to the Bronx, which was three hours away by car, but I needed to cool off with a long walk. Soon, I realized I didn't know my way around. We hadn't explored much since we moved there a few months ago. I turned left and kept walking towards where I thought there would be people. I ended up on a busy road. Big trucks drove past, splashing dirty snow on me, and my shoes got wet. My ex drove by, saw me, but just sped up, still mad from our argument. I thought he might come back for me, but he didn't. I decided to go to my best friend's mom's place in the same area. It started snowing harder, and I was getting tired. I walked past a place where veterans meet, and there was a truck in the driveway. I hadn't noticed the driver until I was past him. He called out, Hey, do you need help? I felt uneasy but realized I might have to accept his help. I walked up to his truck slowly, thinking about what to do. He looked normal enough, an older man with gray hair and greenish blue eyes. I asked him if he was a good or bad person, which sounded silly as soon as I said it. He said he was a good guy, but added he wouldn't tell me if he wasn't. Despite feeling worried, I got into his truck. As we drove, I realized I didn't actually know where my friend's mom lived. I knew the street, but it was long and I didn't know the exact place. I asked to use his phone to call my friend, but she didn't pick up, probably because she didn't recognize the number. I felt really stuck. He asked me about myself, why I was out in the snow in my pajamas. I told him I was from the Bronx and had had a fight with my boyfriend. Then he took a pause and asked, so, uh, are you interested in making some money? I laughed a bit nervously and replied, uh, no, thanks. He then said, well, I thought since you're from the Bronx, but didn't finish his thought. At that moment, I realized I was in a very bad situation. I said, oh, sure, sure, trying to sound calm. He looked at me and laughed in a way that made me feel uncomfortable. Sure, sure, he repeated mockingly. I was really scared but knew I had to hide my fear. I looked outside, hoping to see a soft snowbank that I could jump into if I needed to escape from the truck, but I couldn't find any. The houses were so spread out and it felt like I was trapped. I thought this was how it would all end for me. But then, for some reason, he asked me who I was going to see. I quickly mentioned the names of my best friend's mom and her husband. Suddenly he seemed interested and said he knew the husband. A huge feeling of relief washed over me when he mentioned he knew exactly where they lived. Arriving at the big yellow house felt like reaching a safe place. Feeling a bit braver, I asked for his name. Steve, he replied, and then asked for mine. I told him a made-up name, quickly said thanks, and then ran from his truck to the porch as fast as I could. I burst through the front door, locked it, and started crying while looking for my friend's mom. I woke her up from a deep sleep, but she didn't complain seeing how upset I was. Safe now? I told her everything, the fight, running away, and the scary offer from the man. She listened, shocked and worried. She made me promise to never do something so dangerous again and told me to call her if I needed help. She said she'd talk to her husband about this Steve to find out more. Later that day, I went back to my boyfriend's place and tried to forget the morning's events. The next day, my friend's mom called. She said Steve was known to be dangerous. Her husband had stopped talking to him years ago because Steve had been arrested for assault. She pointed out how easily Steve could have hurt me and left me on a remote road where I wouldn't be found until the snow melted. It was a horrifying thought. Now, for an update. After I shared this story with my best friend, she reminded me of a chilling detail I had forgotten. When her mom called back, she had Steve's last name. A quick search of his name in our town led to a registered sex offender site with his photo. Seeing his cold, empty eyes, 
I realized he was on probation then, which meant he'd have wanted to avoid any trouble. My friend's mom was right. I must have had guardian angels watching over me. So, Steve, you horrible person. I hope we never meet again. This story is something that really happened last night when I was at my grandma's place. Before all these scary things happened, I drove to get some food from McDonald's in the closest city, which is about 20 minutes away. After I got my food, I decided to visit my grandma instead of going straight back home. To give you a picture, her house is at the end of a long country road. You have to turn onto a dirt path that's half a mile long just to get to her house. I got there around 9 in the evening, went inside, and spent some time with my grandma and my brother, who lives with her. My brother has been staying with her to keep her company after our grandpa died. Around 10.30 p.m., my brother and I took grandma's dog, now called Max, outside. We hung out, listened to music, and chatted for a bit. It was getting cold for me, especially since in East Texas, it's not usual for me to feel cold when it drops to the low 40s at night. I was thinking about going inside when I saw something move out of the corner of my eye, near the big metal workshop that's a good distance away from the house. I didn't pay much attention at first because it's normal to see deer or raccoons around. Plus, Max wasn't barking or anything so I thought maybe I was just seeing things. But then, things started to feel strange. The air got colder, and the usual night sounds seemed to stop. My brother noticed it too, and we both felt uneasy. We decided to take Max back inside, but he started acting weird refusing to move and looking towards the dark corners of the yard. We tried to ignore it and went back inside to warm up, thinking it was just our imagination. But as the night went on, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. We heard noises outside, like something was moving around the house. My brother and I decided to check it out, thinking maybe it was just some animal. What we found was far from anything normal or explainable. We saw shadows moving in a way that no animal could and the air around us felt heavy. We couldn't believe what we were seeing, and fear started to take over. We rushed back inside, locked all the doors, and tried to make sense of what was happening. The story doesn't end here, but this is where I'll stop for now. The events that followed were even more terrifying, as we soon realized we were dealing with something that neither of us could have ever imagined. After Grandma went to bed around 11 p.m., my brother and I stayed up playing games and watching videos. When it got really late, around 2.30 a.m., I decided it was time to head home. I always get nervous walking out in the dark, so I made my brother promise to walk me to my car. He teased me about turning off the lights and locking me out, but in the end, he walked with me. I quickly got into my car, locked the doors, and saw the porch light go off as I drove away down the dirt path. I got home in about 10 minutes, made myself some ice cream, and settled in to watch some scary stories on YouTube. Not long after, my brother called me, looking scared. He didn't say much at first, so I asked him what was wrong. He explained that after I left, he went outside to listen to music on the porch. The music was loud enough to drown out any sounds from the woods nearby. But then, he heard what sounded like metal clanging. He stopped the music and listened again. Standing up, he looked towards the workshop in the bow shed, seeing a weak light near the shed that suddenly turned off. He was really scared and went back inside to lock the door. Without thinking to wake Grandma, he grabbed his gun and went back outside. He saw the light again, but it turned off as soon as he noticed. He walked towards the shed, gun in hand, and called out to whoever was there. There was no answer just a soft noise that confirmed someone was definitely out there. Remember, we were in the middle of nowhere, in a small town where everyone knows each other. The nearest neighbor is miles away. No one would be out here without a reason, especially not at this hour. Grandma has had trouble before with strangers coming onto her land, so we always take this seriously. I don't know why my brother didn't call the police, but you have to understand, we have only one police officer in our town, and at 3 a.m., it would take forever for help to arrive. My brother yelled again, asking the person to come out and say who they were. He got really scared when a tall, thin man walked out of the shed with a flashlight. My brother couldn't see his face well, but he knew it was an older man, someone we didn't know, and definitely someone who shouldn't be there at that hour. My brother pointed the gun at him and yelled louder, demanding to know who he was. The man didn't speak, 
but started walking towards my brother, who cocked the gun and warned him he'd shoot. The man raised his hands, saying in a mocking tone to calm down. My brother fired a shot into the air, and that scared the man away. He ran off, and my brother shouted after him, warning him not to come back. Rushing inside, my brother woke up Grandma, who had slept through everything. She didn't seem too worried about calling the police. But all I could think about was what that man wanted. Was he just trying to steal something, or was it something worse? It makes me wonder how many times something like this has happened without us knowing. Was that man hiding and watching us all night? Did he see me going to my car? What if my brother hadn't walked me out? I keep thinking about the danger we were in without even realizing it. I hope that man learned his lesson and won't dare to come back. I grew up in a big town. My mom, dad, and I lived in a small apartment with two rooms. I was the only kid in my family. Some might think that would make me feel alone, but it didn't. We lived in the middle of the town, which meant there were always people around and lots of kids my age to play with. My best buddy was Leo. He lived in another apartment not too far from mine. Leo didn't like the town much. He often talked about wanting to live somewhere with more room and closer to nature. Leo and I were close friends all through school until it was time for college. I went off to study in a different place, and Leo decided to travel the world with just a backpack. He loved adventure while I was the type to plan things out, which is why we chose different paths after finishing school. Even though we went our separate ways, we kept in touch over the years, even if we didn't meet face to face since we were teens. After I finished college, I heard that Leo had moved to a little village a few hours from where I was. It didn't take long for me to decide to visit him. I planned a trip there during a summer weekend when my job wasn't too busy. I took a couple of days off, Thursday and Friday, and set off on Thursday afternoon. When I arrived at the village, I was surprised by how cut off it felt. It was really out of the way. The village was surrounded by forests and lakes. It was truly beautiful, but there wasn't much there except for a good pub. Only a few thousand people lived there. The homes were nice, set along twisty roads that came together at a pretty village center. I drove slowly through the main street, then stopped to look at my phone for directions to Leo's house. I found his place and knocked on the door. As I heard footsteps coming closer, I felt a bit nervous. It had been so long since I last saw my friend. What if he was different now, and we couldn't be friends like before? That worried me a lot. The door opened, and there was Leo, looking almost the same as in my memories, except for a messy beard, and his skin was darker from the sun. Talking again felt like no time had passed. He was still the Leo I knew. We decided to eat and have some drinks at the local bar. It was surprisingly crowded for such a small place. Even though it was just a Thursday, there were about 30 or 40 people there. Right after we sat down, my attention was drawn to a man sitting not far from us. He seemed older in his 40s, wearing a worn out baseball cap and a gray shirt. He was a big guy, but sitting down, I couldn't tell how tall he was. He caught my eye because he was loud and unpleasant. I mentioned him to Leo and he told me the man's name was Tom, and he was known for being trouble around here. When the waitress went to Tom's table, he treated her badly and even yelled at her for being slow. I looked at Leo, feeling upset. Just ignore him, don't get involved, Leo advised. I agreed, but it bothered me to see someone treat a waitress like that. My mom used to be a waitress, and I know how tough their job is. Seeing someone be so disrespectful made me angry. Despite that, Leo and I managed to have a great time. We ate, had some drinks, and talked about old times. Tom was still there, getting louder and more annoying as the night went on. He was clearly drunk. Trying to ignore him was hard, but being with Leo again made me happy, so I didn't let it spoil our evening. When we finally left the bar late at night, we went back to Leo's house. He had prepared a room for me to sleep in, right at the front of his home. The window in my room looked out onto the street, and Leo had put up a sheet over it for privacy. Without it, anyone walking by could see inside. The street lights outside made a soft glow around the edges of the window, held off by the sheet. I couldn't sleep, just staring up at the ceiling in the dark. Then, out of nowhere, a weak scream cut through the night. It sounded like it was coming from the direction of the pub. 
The scream was muffled by the window so I couldn't make out any words. It went on for a bit, then stopped. I tried to ignore it, but I had to know what was happening. I quietly got up, put on my shoes, and tiptoed out the front door. Turning the corner, I saw four men standing by an alley next to the pub. There was a street light shining down on them. I hid behind a tree to watch. That's when I saw who had screamed. One of the men moved, and there was Tom, looking like he couldn't move at all. He was beaten up badly and lying still. I stayed hidden, scared they would see me. Taking a deep breath, I peeked again. Two of the men dragged Tom's body to a car parked nearby and put him in the trunk. I ran back to Leo's house, woke him up, and told him everything. We called the police right away, but the police didn't seem worried. They said they'd check it out but didn't come to talk to us or anything. I couldn't believe it. I had just seen someone get hurt really bad, and it felt like the police didn't care. The next morning, we went to the police station to tell them what I saw. They said they were working on it but couldn't share any details, which I found strange since I was a witness. Feeling unsafe and upset, I decided to leave early. I couldn't stay in that village any longer. It didn't matter that Tom wasn't nice. Nobody deserves to be hurt like that. I just hoped the police were actually going to do something about what happened. My husband Tom and I have a big love for driving around. We usually go for long drives, but sometimes, on weekends or late evenings when we're bored, we simply enjoy a quiet drive on less crowded roads. One evening, finding ourselves with nothing much to do, we decided to go for one of these drives. We headed north towards a small village, roughly 30 minutes from where we live, known for its winding, smooth roads. This village lies at the foot of some mountains, and there's this one road that goes straight up into the mountains if you follow it far enough. It was around 9 p.m., and the roads were mostly empty, given it's a quiet, quaint place. We drove past the houses and shops, and soon the road began to twist and climb. After driving in the darkness for about 15 minutes, we noticed some flashing lights ahead. Getting closer, we saw it was a truck parked on the side of the road, facing our direction. A chill ran down my spine at the thought of encountering a broken-down truck so far from civilization. As we neared the truck, I urged Tom to turn the car around confessing that I had a really bad feeling about this. But by then, we were already next to the truck. A young man with blonde hair, appearing to be in his late 20s, walked over to our car. Feeling uneasy, I insisted Tom keep the windows up. Tom seemed to sense the tension too, and heeded my advice. From inside the car, Tom asked what was wrong. The young man replied that his truck had broken down and he could use some help. He mentioned his phone battery was dead too. Tom inquired about the truck's issue, but the man persisted, asking us to come out and take a look. He was overly friendly, even calling Tom bro and expressing his relief at seeing us. This situation felt increasingly off to me, the isolation of our surroundings adding to the sense of dread. Tom hesitated, torn between helping and the unease we both felt, signaling the beginning of a night that was about to take a turn into the truly unsettling. Tom told the man, Sorry, I really don't know much about fixing cars, but I'll try calling for help. The man became clearly upset at this, his frustration growing. Meanwhile, I glanced back at his truck and thought I saw something moving inside. It made me even more anxious. We should leave right now, I urged Tom, fear evident in my voice. Seeing how scared I was, Tom quickly shifted the car into reverse. But then, he noticed the man had moved behind our car, looking really stressed rubbing his face and pacing back and forth. With no way to reverse without risking hitting the man, Tom decided to drive forward a bit to find a spot to turn around. The road ahead turned into a dirt path, providing just enough room on the side for Tom to maneuver the car around. The thought of passing by the truck again filled me with dread, especially since our phones had no service, leaving us completely cut off. I tried to rationalize the situation in my mind, Maybe the man genuinely needed help, and perhaps he wasn't alone. He might have had a friend in the truck, but deep down, a strong feeling told me something wasn't right. When we got back to where the truck had been, it was gone. We drove around a bit more, but there was no sign of it. Considering we hadn't gone very far initially, it was both a relief and a source of fear that the truck had disappeared so quickly. How could they have fixed it and left in such a short time? 
Trying to calm down, I suggested to Tom that maybe the truck had somehow started working again, allowing them to drive away. It felt strange, but not totally impossible. As we continued our drive, the road began to straighten, and in the distance we could see the truck again. This time, its lights were off, parked on the side of the road, with some activity happening in its back. Why have they turned off all their lights? I wondered aloud. It seemed like they were too far for us to see clearly, but we could make out two people moving to the other side of the truck, then ducking down as though trying to hide from us. As we got closer, Tom pressed the gas pedal hard. Zooming past the truck, the two men stood up. It was the same guy we had talked to earlier, and another person we hadn't seen before, both looking shocked to see us speed by. One of them started running after us, getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. I kept glancing back, my heart racing with fear, when suddenly the truck's headlights flickered on and it started chasing us at high speed. Tom kept the speed up, and after a tense few minutes we finally lost sight of the headlights. Even as we made our way back to the city, I couldn't stop looking back, half expecting them to reappear, possibly with their lights off, sneaking up on us. When we finally felt safe, we tried to shake off the fear convincing ourselves we were no longer being followed. We decided to report the incident to the police on a non-emergency line, describing the man, the truck, and what happened. Although we regretted not noting the truck's license plate in our panic. We shared what we could, but without more to go on, there wasn't much the police could do. Reflecting on it, sure, there might be logical explanations for everything that happened, but the fear in those moments was real. Out there, in the complete isolation, countless dangers crossed our minds. They could have had weapons, blocked the road, or even laid traps to stop our car. And while there might be answers for some of our questions, others remain. Why was the man vague about the truck's problem? How did they manage to get the truck running so quickly? Why did they hide in the darkness? A year has passed since that night, and it now feels like a distant, eerie memory. We still enjoy our drives, but we've since stuck to more populated areas, especially at night. The experience has left us with a lingering caution and a reminder of the unexpected dangers that can lurk on seemingly peaceful night drives. Back when I was a student, I always rode a motorcycle. It was how I got around. During the summer, I would work at hotel bars, mixing drinks. About six years ago, I found myself working at this big, old hotel located in a very quiet part of the country. One night, after a really long day, I finished up at around 2 in the morning. I had to walk through the hotel's basement to get to my bike and head home. I still remember how cold and silent it was outside after the hot, busy night inside. There was something peaceful about it. Even though I was out there alone, in the middle of nowhere, riding my bike at such a late hour. I quickly passed through the nearest town and then took the dark country roads towards my home. At this time, I was riding an old Honda 125cc. It wasn't much, but it was reliable, even if the headlight wasn't very bright and tended to flicker. So there I was, riding in complete darkness, surrounded by fields and woods, all by myself for about 20 minutes. Then suddenly, I saw a flash of bright blue lights in my mirror. A car with very bright headlights came up fast behind me. It was a big Range Rover. It zoomed past me really close, and I honked at them loud and long. That was a bad idea. The Range Rover cut in front of me and slammed on the brakes, trying to make me crash or hit them. Even though my bike was old and had drum brakes, I managed to stop in time. I didn't crash into that crazy driver in front. I managed to stop my bike without crashing. Just then, I saw the door of the Range Rover slightly open, and a shadowy figure began to step out. In a panic, I pushed my small Honda to its limit, trying to pass the car. But as I tried to speed past, the driver of the Range Rover quickly closed his door, stepped on the gas, and pulled up right beside me. He then began to push me off the road, moving closer and closer, forcing me towards the ditch. Fighting to keep control on the slippery, wet grass beside the road, I struggled not to let my bike fall into the ditch. Somehow, I managed to get back on the road. Then. I saw the man stop his car, get out, and walk to the back. He opened the trunk and seemed to be looking for something. I quickly turned my bike, ready to speed off in any direction to escape. I took one last look at him and saw him pulling something long and big from the trunk. 
I didn't wait to see what it was. I sped off, glancing back after a bit to see him driving away from where I had been. But then, he stopped at the top of the road and just waited there, his car lights shining on the road. It was so quiet and spooky. My heart was racing, but everything felt so slow. I knew I couldn't go back that way. I decided to find another way home, even though it was completely dark. Before leaving, I checked my phone, hoping for some help, but there was no signal at all. Yes, that night was one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had. A few years back, something scary happened to my best friend and me. I thought it might be a good idea to share this story here. When we were in our last year of high school, my best friend and I decided to visit my grandmother. She lived a couple of hours away from our small town in Georgia, which was quite big compared to other towns around. To get to her place, we had to drive through several small country towns for about two and a half hours. On our way back, we needed to stop for gas. We found a station in the middle of nowhere. Imagine a place surrounded by fields of corn and cotton, roads without any signs or lights, and no cell service at all. The store next to the gas station had a few snacks but looked empty, so we decided to just get gas and leave. I paid with my card because I didn't want to leave my friend, who was very small and light, alone in the car. While I was filling up the car, another vehicle pulled up on the other side of the pump. Remembering all the creepy stories I've read online, I felt uneasy and stayed outside the car with my door wide open so my friend could see and hear everything. A skinny man, probably in his late fifties, got out of the other car. He seemed to be paying at the pump but then came around to my side and got very close to me, offering to pump my gas. I had the gas nozzle locked so I didn't need to hold it. I positioned myself to either jump in the car or close the door to protect my friend if needed. I told him no thanks, but he looked me over and said, Pretty girls like you shouldn't be out here alone. You need a man to help you. Then he tried to grab the gas pump from my hand. I pulled my hand away and slammed the car door closed. I didn't want him getting into the car and driving off with my friend. I was really scared now. I always try to be polite, but I remembered reading online that it's better to be safe and appear rude than to be polite and feel unsafe. So, I spoke up firmly. Sir, please back off. I can fill up the car myself. I've already told you no thanks. Just leave us be. He didn't budge, just lifted his head to look me straight in the eyes, his smirk completely gone. I held his gaze, deciding I had enough fuel to get us out of this eerie place. With a determined look, I yanked the nozzle out, practically slamming it back on the pump, then jumped into my car and sped off before he could react. As we left, I peeked in the rearview mirror and noticed his car wasn't even getting gas. It seemed like he was just passing through and thought to offer his help to someone he saw as in trouble, even though I was far from needing any help. My friend was trembling all the way back, saying she would have just let the man help us with the gas. But I'm thankful for the bravery I've built up from reading stories on this forum. It made me alert and gave me the courage to handle such a weird situation. And as for the man at that desolate gas station in nowhere Georgia trying to be overly helpful, I hope we never cross paths again. Five years ago, something scary happened to me. After a hard breakup, I decided to do things alone and become more independent. I started going to movies and eating out by myself. I lived in a place called Green Valley, a place with lots of outdoor activities. I thought camping by myself would be a good challenge, so I packed up and went to Pine Ridge Springs. Pine Ridge Springs is a natural hot spring with a few small pools in the mountains, far from any town. It's very isolated. To get there, you walk a short distance from the road through the forest. The nearest store is a long drive away. There's no hotel or anything. It's just a place in the forest with warm water pools. You might be the only one there. It was still bright outside, so I planned to enjoy the hot spring first, then set up my camp. When I got there, I saw a man and a woman in the main pool. They seemed surprised to see me. I greeted them from afar as I walked closer. At first, they just looked at me without saying anything. Then the man asked me what I was doing. I was confused and told him I didn't understand his question. The man suddenly asked me if I was the person who had been hiding and watching them from the trees for over an hour. I quickly told them no, that I had just arrived and had no idea what they were talking about. They explained there was someone off the trail in the forest who had been spying on them. This person, they said, 
ignored their shouts, disappearing into the trees only to appear again later, silently watching. Once they were sure I wasn't the stranger, I took off my clothes and joined them in the warm water. Their eyes were really wide, like they had seen something strange or were scared. I guess they might have taken some magic mushrooms because of how they acted and the look in their eyes. It seemed like the sort of thing people do here, though I didn't ask. I thought maybe their fear was just a bad reaction to the mushrooms. We talked for a bit, first about the mysterious person watching them, then about lighter topics. They seemed to feel better having someone else around. Maybe because I'm a big guy, they felt safer. After a while, they left the pool, and I was alone. Then I heard yelling from the woods. Worried someone might need help, I got out of the pool quickly, not even fully dry, and started to dress. Hearing another loud call, I hurried along the path. Soon I found the couple again. They were yelling into the forest pretending to have a gun, which they didn't. They told me the creepy person had been standing on the path, just staring at them from a distance. When they shouted at him, he went back into the trees. The situation was getting more frightening by the minute. Now, the strange man was gone from our sight. All this time, we never got a clear look at him. We decided to head back to where we parked our cars. We agreed to camp close to each other. There was a campground that charged money, but the guy said he knew a free spot not too far away. I followed them there. They set up their tent, and I set mine up about a hundred yards from them. I wanted to give them space, and also wanted to experience camping alone. Because it was a dry season in raw forest, we didn't start any fires. I spent my time reading and enjoying nature until mosquitoes forced me into my tent around 6 p.m. By 9, I was deep asleep. Suddenly, around midnight, screams woke me up. I grabbed my flashlight and my small .22 pistol, slipped on my shoes without tying them, and ran towards their tent. They were outside, panicking, saying the man had come close to their tent and we needed to leave fast. They showed me a cut in their tent's fabric, made with a knife. In a rush, they packed up and we headed to our cars. That's when I realized I hadn't grabbed my gear. I asked if they'd come back with me to collect it, but they refused, drove off, and left me alone. After thinking it over, I decided to retrieve my belongings myself. It was a long drive back, and I was already there. However, using my gun, even in self-defense, would lead to complications I wanted to avoid. I turned off my flashlight and moved quietly back to my tent, hoping to hear him without making any noise myself. It took me 20 minutes to reach my tent through the silent forest. My tent was untouched. I quickly packed up, holding my flashlight in my mouth, and carried my tent with everything inside. I ran back to my car, gun in hand. I drove off, realizing later that I never actually saw the mysterious man. I started doubting whether he was real. It crossed my mind that maybe the couple had pranked me, though they seemed genuinely scared. I'll never know for sure if there was a man in the woods or if it was all a setup. If it was a joke, they deserved awards for their acting. But the mystery remains unsolved. I'm from India, and right now, I'm studying at a university far from my home state. This area is known for high crime rates, with many crimes not even reported, and a lot of corruption. The farther you go from the cities, the less people care about official laws. Instead, local rules dominate. Because of space needs, they usually build universities in remote, rural places. My university is in one of those remote areas. Now let me share my story. After finishing my final exams for the semester, my friends and I decided to celebrate in the city. We lost track of time and only started heading back to our university at 9.30 p.m., which was a two-hour drive away. Traveling at night here isn't safe. While we were on the highway, we hit traffic. Our taxi driver decided to take a shortcut, turning onto a lonely road near a village close to our university. This was a terrible choice. Another car, probably thinking the same thing, followed us down this dark path with only a few shops and huts scattered around. Suddenly, about ten locals blocked our path and the other cars. They demanded we pay a toll to use the road. This wasn't unusual. Nighttime tolls are common here, charged by locals who know they have the upper hand. These aren't official tolls, but everyone understands you're expected to pay. The men blocking us were clearly drunk and looking for trouble. 
Our driver tried to argue, saying we shouldn't have to pay, but they weren't willing to listen. Being here for two years and talking to the people working at the university, I learned to understand the local way of speaking pretty well. At one point, the driver's begging made these men even angrier, and one of them yelled out. In a burst of anger, he threatened, If you don't follow the rules, you won't leave here alive. That's when I noticed something terrifying. Five men were standing near our car, and the one who had shouted was holding a gun, while two others had very long knives. We all realized then that we had no choice but to pay the toll. We quickly took out money and handed it over, hoping to leave safely. Just seeing the gun was frightening, but what happened next was even worse. Do you remember me mentioning another car that had also been stopped? Half of the men had come to demand money from us, and the other half went to deal with that car, which had just one driver. It seems like that driver argued with them too. But he didn't agree to pay, and the drunk locals lost their patience. They pulled the man from his car and started attacking him right there, hitting him with sticks and stones. Then, the men with knives from our group joined in, taking turns to stab him. The only weapon not used was the gun. We heard no shots. We had to watch this man being attacked right in front of us, feeling completely helpless. We knew staying there could mean we'd end up the same way. It felt like we were watching for hours, but it was really only 20 to 30 seconds. Our driver realized what was happening and sped away. We called the police right away, but there was no police station near that village. Our driver said what we already knew, the police would arrive too late. And since the police were from the area, they often had deals with groups like this and ignored what they did. We got back to the university, very upset, and I was so scared. We told our university officials and they promised to look into it, but we never heard back. We're all trying to deal with having seen what was probably a murder. I don't want to upset anyone, but crimes like this happen here. This country is beautiful, with a rich culture and history. But like any place, it has its dark parts. And seeing one of them, even just for a short time, has left a mark on me I'll never forget. I live by myself in a little town, far from my family. I don't have any relatives nearby, so I often go to see them. Most of the time I visit my mom and my very old grandma, who are in another small town about 150 miles away from my place. Every month I make the trip to see them. I drive there in my new car, a Tesla Model S. So this story is about one of those visits. I plan to go see them over the weekend. When the day arrived, I packed some things, got into my car, and started the long drive to their place. Right after leaving my town, the road splits in two. One path goes to my grandma's town. Since it's a really tiny place, there's hardly any traffic. I left in the morning, hoping to get back by 6 p.m. because I had work the next morning. I had a great time that day, enjoying my visit with my grandma. But when I was about to leave at 6 p.m., my cousins showed up. They insisted I stay a bit longer. Thinking about my boring job, I decided to stay and enjoy some time with my cousins. Even though I knew it might make me late for work, I stayed. We had a barbecue, talked a lot, and enjoyed ourselves. I left around 9 p.m. I was so exhausted I could barely keep my eyes open. The road home runs through dense woods, making it feel very spooky at night. To keep myself awake, I blasted music. But I was so tired I almost fell asleep at the wheel. My Tesla has autopilot. And even though it seemed like a bad idea, I was so sleepy I thought it might help me stay on the road. If something went wrong, I planned to take over driving. That was a big mistake. I eventually dozed off despite trying to stay awake. I woke up later to find my car acting wildly and alerting me to an obstacle ahead. As soon as I realized my car had stopped, I was confused and tried to make the autopilot work again. But when I looked up to see why my car wouldn't move, I felt like my heart skipped a beat. My breath stopped for a moment. There was a man right in front of my car looking it over. My windows are tinted very dark, so he couldn't see inside. Then, I heard a knock on my window and saw another person. I was frozen in fear, unable to move or think clearly. Then the man by my door began scratching my window with a knife. I was so scared I felt like I couldn't even breathe, but somehow I managed to put my car in reverse and hit the gas. The two men jumped away, surprised by my sudden move. Driving away, I saw another man standing by a car I hadn't noticed before, holding what seemed to be a crowbar. 
in my rearview mirror, I saw them getting into their car and starting to chase me, but they couldn't keep up with my Tesla, which quickly reached over 120 miles per hour. I lost them quickly. As soon as I got home, I called my mom to tell her what happened. She was really scared and wanted to call the police, but I didn't because I didn't have any details about the men. They were all dressed in black and wore masks. I didn't catch their car's license plate either, but I have a guess about what happened. They must have driven in front of me, making my car slow down and stop. They probably tried to knock on my window while I was asleep. They must have been confused by my car's dark windows, unable to see me. Then, one of them might have gone to get something to break my window or open my car door. I'm just grateful I woke up and escaped before they could do anything. This experience still terrifies me, and I've had many nightmares since. To those men who tried to harm me, I wish you never managed to do that to anyone. I am a 23-year-old woman with Cherokee heritage from Georgia, USA. At the time of this story, my fiancé and I were living on a big farm in Virginia. We didn't actually farm, we just rented a little house on the property and could walk around the farm as we liked. I was 19 then, and it was just me, my fiancé, our cat, and our dog living in our house. Our cat was a crazy barn cat we found and couldn't leave behind because I always want to help animals in need. Our dog, a kind-hearted pit bull, was both big and a bit of a chicken, even though she weighed about 75 pounds. Our place was on a big piece of land, around 20 acres, and our driveway alone was quite long, about half a mile. I usually walked the dog when I got back from work, and most times, my fiancé would join me. It wasn't that I was scared to go alone, but he played a lot of video games, and a walk was good for him. Beyond our driveway was a road that went on for 12 miles through woods and farms before it hit any busy area. So we were quite isolated, except for our landlord. The road first went through open farmland, then a short stretch of woods, followed by wheat fields for about half a mile, and then deep forest for two more miles. One weekday, like any other, we got home to our cozy house and our happy pets. Harley, our dog, couldn't wait to go out, so I quickly changed and asked my fiancé if he was coming along. He didn't want to. He had just gotten back and mentioned seeing a coyote near our house. Coyotes are usually not a big threat here, they often scavenge, so I wasn't worried. I can take care of myself. I teased him for being scared and told Harley it was just us tonight. We started out towards the driveway as the sun was setting. The October chill was in the air, moving through the cornfields by our driveway. The corn was tall, about six feet, making it hard to see through. I figured my fiancé was just trying to spook me. You couldn't spot a coyote in these fields. Harley was having a blast, running through the corn as we walked up the driveway. Knowing how timid she was, I was sure she'd let me know if anything was wrong. By the time we got to the end of the driveway, it was dark, but the moon was bright enough that I didn't need my flashlight. We turned left and walked past the first field of soybeans. They're not tall, so I saw some deer, but nothing worrying. We enjoyed our walk, playing fetch with Harley, just normal stuff between a dog and her owner. Then we got to a small patch of trees. Harley nudged me, alerting me to something. It wasn't a coyote or deer, but a rabbit that had been hit by a car. It was still alive, but not for long. I felt bad, but I knew what I had to do. I used my knife to end its suffering, a quick decision taught by my family. I felt a mix of sadness and relief that we only saw some deer and the injured rabbit. We kept walking, entering a tall wheat field. It was quiet, and Harley seemed calm, so I guessed if there were any coyotes, they were gone. We then moved towards a spot where the wheat was on our left and the forest on our right. Suddenly, everything went silent. Harley pressed close to me, and I heard the sound of movement from the wheat field. I caught a glimpse of three tails moving back toward the woods. These eastern coyotes might be small, but they're intimidating when together. Harley's fur stood on end, and I shouted as loudly as I could, GO AWAY! LEAVE! The coyotes got scared and ran off into the trees. Thinking it best, I decided we should head back home before they thought to come back. I'm not scared easily, but walking towards a dark forest with a pack of coyotes and my fearful pit bull didn't seem smart. As we turned to leave, the rustling noise came again. At first I thought it was a confused coyote left behind, but it wasn't. Harley froze, focusing on the wheat, 
I whistled for her, that sharp, loud whistle you do with your fingers. And then, chillingly, my whistle was echoed from the field. Memories of old family stories flooded my mind, half expecting a tall, shadowy figure to step out. Yet, nothing appeared. There was no smell of decay, no overwhelming fear, just a deep curiosity mixed with fright. I whistled once more, and again it was mimicked, sounding almost human but not quite right. Ignoring my instincts, I called out, Hello, and to my shock, Hello, came back in my own voice. My hand tightened around my knife as I demanded, Show yourself! But only silence followed. No sound of wildlife. Not even the distant yelps of coyotes. Just the sound of my breathing. Then the rustling began once more, and I flicked on my flashlight, pointing it towards the noise. The light from my flashlight landed on a sight that left me puzzled and scared even now. Eyes shone back at me, that green-yellow glow you see in animals at night. But what they belonged to didn't make any sense at all. There was a young girl, couldn't have been older than 14 or 16, hiding among the wheat. She was dressed in something that looked like deer skin. She was very skinny, and her skin looked like it never got any sunlight. Her hair was long, messy, mixed with pieces of wheat and leaves. She could have been pretty in another situation, but right then, she looked scary. We just looked at each other for what seemed like a long time, but was probably only a minute. Then, out of nowhere a coyote howled from the woods. We both looked towards the sound, and right after she ran off into the wheat towards the noise. At the same time, Harley ran back towards our house, and I followed quickly. We didn't stop until we reached the driveway. I slowed down there because I didn't want my fiancé to see me scared. I could still hear the coyotes howling far away as we walked fast back to our house. We got back without anything else happening, and I decided not to tell my fiancé. I didn't want him to go out there with his gun. The girl hadn't hurt me, so I thought it wasn't right to go after her. That night, I woke up to coyotes howling outside our house. This wasn't strange, but now I wondered if she was with them. About a month later, as I was driving home from work, I had almost convinced myself I had imagined that night. But then, I had to stop my car suddenly to avoid hitting something. In the darkness, when my headlights caught its eyes, they glowed green and yellow. It looked like a big coyote, just staring at me before it ran off into the woods. It sounds crazy, but I keep thinking about if that was her.